The title of Joe's talk is Forensic Psychiatric Experiences, Stigma, and Self-Concept. Mental illness self-stigma is when people diagnosed with mental illness believe that society's negative beliefs of them are true. Joe's presentation will discuss stigma and self-concept theory and report on data showing that multiple stigmatized labels can combine and magnify negative outcomes. Audience, please hold your questions and comments to the end so as to not interrupt our presenter who's pretty new to Second Life. Welcome, Joe. The floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Pecos Kid, and uh, congratulations on your 11 years. I'm happy to be here today and speak to you all about forensic psychiatric experiences, stigma, and self-concept. You all know who I am now after that nice introduction, so I'll skip that part. So I just wanted to acknowledge the various contributors on this project. We had six of them. The main researcher and author on the publications and the research that I'll discuss is Dr. Michelle West. This was actually the topic of her dissertation a few years ago, and she's now a licensed psychologist in the United States and also a researcher still in psychology. So I first wanted to give just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. So first I'll give some definitions, background, and theory on what I'm talking about. Then I'll talk about the research study that we conducted. And I'll end with some conclusions, discussion, and implications for the research. And I look forward to uh, hearing some questions and, and feedback as well. Um, I like starting off with a take-home message just to keep a, a theme in mind of, of what we'll be talking about today. And that take-home message is that multiple stigmatized identities can impact one's self-concept, their identity, and in turn influence psychiatric treatment, psychiatric treatment outcomes. Excuse me. So just to start off with some definitions. Uh, so when I say forensic psychiatric experiences, I'm talking about people living with mental illness who have faced criminal charges, who have had some involvement in the uh, legal system. Uh, and these individuals may be currently in a court diversion program. Uh, they may be in a long-term inpatient hospital. But these are individuals who have had some contact with the legal system in the United States, or the forensic system, you might call it. Uh, Pecos Kid said a little bit about stigma. I'll, I'll just add a little more. So uh, stigma involves stereotyping and devaluing individuals uh, just based on their membership in a particular social group. So an example of this would be labeling individuals with mental illness as quote-unquote dangerous or quote-unquote unpredictable. Um, so attaching stereotypes to a label. Stigma can manifest in many ways in society. So it can manifest in what we call structural stigma. So this may include prejudicial policies and laws in society that inhibit opportunities for people with mental illness or discriminate them in some way. It also includes public stigma. So this is the more uh, common type that we know about. And this is uh, negative attitudes towards people with mental illness, like the ones I mentioned before, believing people with mental illness are dangerous, etc. And then there's also a form of stigma that has really been researched a lot in the past uh, decade or so plus, and that's called self or internalized stigma. I'll refer to it as self stigma today. So one consequence of stigma is that people may internalize stigmatizing beliefs of people in society. And there are two basic prerequisites for this to occur. 
So there has to be, of course, some consciousness, awareness of the stigma of the stereotype. So being aware that people believe this about mental illness. And also being aware, of course, of group membership. So being aware that you may be someone diagnosed with mental illness and then knowing that there are stereotypes about that, uh, that is necessary uh, to potentially lead to self-stigma. An example of an item we use in research, and this is actually an item we used in the current research project along with other items, other uh, statements, uh, might be, because I have a mental illness, I am dangerous. So that is self-stigma right there. That is someone who is living with a mental illness and buying into a stereotype. They're internalizing that stereotype. Another one might be, because I have a mental illness, I will not recover or get better. Again, buying into a societal stereotype that people with mental illness um, cannot get effective treatment, will never get better, et cetera. All of these stereotypes, which, which are untrue. Uh, Self-stigma actually affects a relatively high percentage of people with severe mental illness. And if you were here earlier for Dr. Janos's talk, uh, he's actually my mentor, and he talked a bit about self-stigma, I know, as well. Um, and it could be um, a kind of really negative phenomenon for people. It could predict poor functional and treatment outcomes, lead to lower self-esteem, uh, lead to kind of less involvement in psychiatric care, and, and in turn lead to a lot of negative outcomes. So it's really important to be talking about self-stigma. So just a bit of uh, further background. So in addition to mental health, which is definitely stigmatized uh, worldwide, people, people can be stigmatized based on many different labels. Stereotypes about people with mental illness, like I've mentioned, overlap with stereotypes about criminal offenders and ethnic racial minorities, right? We know there are stereotypes about those groups too. And we also know that racial minorities are overrepresented in the correctional system um, and kind of disproportionately represented uh, really around the world in criminal justice institutions. And we hypothesized, and we were kind of putting this into a theory as we worked on this research, that this may lead to a triple stigma to someone who has forensic involvement, someone who is of an ethnic or racial minority group, and someone who's living with a mental illness. We believe that maybe those three different uh, stigmatized identities, potentially, could magnify the effects of stigma. So just to speak about these other stigmas a little more. So for example, someone who uh, has a legal history background, maybe they've committed a crime or they've been convicted of a crime in the past, they may endorse this statement, because I am an offender, I am a bad person, right? That would be self-stigma. When it comes to race and ethnicity, um, someone may believe, I feel bad about the race and ethnicity I belong to. Right, another idea, uh, or rather example, of self-stigma. That you are internalizing society's negative attitudes about your group. Not that everyone believes this, but that this stereotype is kind of in the air, that people know it exists. So what is self-concept? Um, it's sort of synonymous with identity. Uh, self-concept is the way we formulate our identity. It's who we are. So everyone in the audience today may want to think about, you know, what makes up them as a person? What's their self-concept? You may be a son or a daughter, a mother or a father. Um, you may be uh, someone in a particular profession, uh, a coordinator of something, a boss of something. Um, and self-concept is really a multi-dimensional concept. It, it relies both on our own labels about ourselves and who we think we are. But self-concept also takes into account what other people think we are. And that's kind of where self-stigma comes into play. Because membership and social groups, including stigmatized ones, are typically integrated into one self-concept. So for example, I am a person, someone might say, I am a person with a mental illness. I am a person with a legal history. And then they have to contend with what that means for them. So all of these labels obviously can affect how, one's view, how one uh, views oneself. 
Uh, and the overlap of these labels may uniquely impact racial minorities labeled forensic psychiatric patients, given the, the stigma and the stereotypes related to individuals of ethnic and racial minority, minority groups. Um, and I think this may be uh, best to visualize this. So I wanted to provide uh, two visual aids. And right now I'm showing a, a pie chart. And this is a hypothetical person with um, kind of low self-stigma, right? So this is someone who doesn't believe their mental illness will hold them back. Um, they are proud of their race and ethnicity, think their mental illness has made them a tough survivor, and they don't think their legal involvement necessarily makes them a bad person. So this is someone who has integrated these social identities in a relatively positive uh, and adaptive way. Now on the flip side, someone with high self-stigma, this is another pie chart I'm showing, may think that uh, they're not proud of their racial or ethnic heritage. Because they have a mental illness, they believe they won't recover, or they might believe they're dangerous. And they may also believe because they uh, have an offense history in the legal system that they're a bad person. Now, these two examples of, are, of course, extremes. So we have a low self-stigma and a high self-stigma, but there are many variations in between. So someone may stigmatize themselves really for having a mental illness, but still be proud of their uh, racial and ethnic heritage. But these are just two examples to uh, illustrate self-stigma. So why did uh, we do this research? So although mental illness uh, self-stigma research has received a lot of uh, research attention, uh, recently, less research has explored the impact of multiple stigmatized identities. And instead, like I said, most research looks at stigmatized identities in isolation. So they'll look at mental illness self-stigma, they may look at self-stigma about being of a certain racial or ethnic group, but often uh, they're not looked at together. And on this slide, I have um, a picture of a person, kind of like a stick figure, I believe, uh, representing sort of intersectionality. So this is the idea that we have many different characteristics and intersections, again, both self-labeled and kind of ascribed to us um, by society. And I'll refer back to this image, but keep that theme in mind of uh, intersectionality. So for our research study, this was a few years ago, but we've slowly kind of put the data together and recently published another paper a few months ago. Uh, we recruited 82 adult participants uh, from two urban sites in the United States. So one was a long-term inpatient psychiatric hospital, and the other was a mental health court diversion program. So a mental health court diversion program, for those of you who don't know, is an outpatient program for people who have been arrested uh, for some type of crime in the community, uh, but they are mandated to treatment by law and they're allowed to live in the community, but they have to kind of attend treatment for a year to two years and then their charges are dropped. Uh, of course, we did inform consent. We made sure that we could access uh, participants' charts uh, with their permission. Uh, we protected participant uh, data with identification numbers. Nothing was attached to people's names in the end. And uh, participants were compensated for their time. So participants were asked to complete several questionnaires, and I'll refer to these throughout. So we asked about participants' experiences of discrimination, we asked about self-stigma related to mental illness, race or ethnicity, being an offender. And then we asked about psychiatric treatment outcomes like self-esteem, depression, medication adherence, so are you taking your medication consistently, working alliance, how well do you work with your therapist, and this TST, a 20 statements test item, which I'll talk about later. And we also had some clinicians fill out questionnaires too for us. So we had the perspective of both the participant and also their therapist or case manager. <clears throat> Excuse me, case manager. <clears throat> 
And as I'll talk about uh, later on as well, we also did some qualitative interviews. So these are one-on-one -on -one interviews where we asked a lot of open-ended questions. We did that with eight participants. So now I'll talk first about some of the demographics of our study. Uh, so you will see a chart up here, uh, which shows sort of the mean age, uh, age at first hospitalization, things like that. Um, I will read off some of these. So our sample was predominantly male, uh, also mostly Latino, Latina, or Black, largely middle-aged and single, and varying educational backgrounds. Uh, the majority of our participants did have a psychotic spectrum disorder like schizophrenia or a mood disorder like depression or bipolar disorder um, and about 50% had a dual diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Most common criminal charges were either drug related uh, but we also had some charges related to attempted murder or Okay, move on to the next one. Okay, so we had a few hypotheses going into this study. Uh, the first one, uh, unsurprisingly, we believe that discrimination experiences uh, due to mental illness, race, and criminal history would be commonly reported. We also believe that having self-stigma of mental illness would be associated with higher depression, lower self-esteem, and lower uh, treatment adherence and working alliance. And also that racial self-concept or self-stigma uh, and criminality self-stigma would moderate this relationship between mental illness, self-stigma, and outcomes. Essentially in statistical terms, that means that combining these stigmatized identities together, so having a high racial self-stigma, having a high mental illness self-stigma, combining those together would lead to negative outcomes. That's all that means. And right now I'm just showing a, a picture of uh, two of our publications, one from the International Journal of Forensic Mental Health and the other from a Psychiatric Rehabilitation Journal. Okay, so in regard to our first hypothesis, we did find that most participants reported that they had experienced discrimination at some point, about 65%. Most commonly reported discrimination experiences uh, were in the context of employment, so that it stopped you from getting a job, it stopped you from getting Get housing, it stopped you from getting uh, treatment or education. And we found that most people were uh, affected by stigma related to their race or ethnicity, but they were also affected by stigma related to mental illness and incarceration. To a somewhat lesser degree, but, but still, it's, it's quite a large percentage of people experiencing discrimination. So moving on to our second hypothesis. We did find that people who had more of this mental illness self-stigma uh, they were significantly more likely to have more depression, lower self-esteem, and lower adherence to taking their medication. So again, these are people who believe that, oh, because I have a mental illness, I can't recover. Because I have a mental illness, I'm dangerous. Similarly, we found that people who had high criminality self-stigma, uh, they had a, a lower working alliance with their therapist. But what that means is they had uh, less of a of an ability to agree on tasks and goals or create a relationship with a therapist, which we know is, is an important factor to uh, the, the therapy process. And again, people high on criminality, self-stigma might believe because I am an offender, I am bad, right? And then lastly, people who had high racial self-stigma um, also had higher depression, lower self-esteem, and lower treatment compliance and working alliance. Uh, so again, these are people who may believe that they're not proud of their race or ethnicity, that it makes them bad to be part of a certain racial or ethnic group. So in sum, kind of having these negative attitudes internalized uh, can lead to a lot of negative outcomes. 
So what about the relationship between these three stigmas? So we just looked at them in isolation, but what about when we combine them? So we found that higher mental illness self-stigma uh, significantly related to both higher expectations of discrimination due to being an offender and high criminality uh, self-stigma. So again, if you're high on mental illness uh, self-stigma, um, you were more likely to have high expectations of being discriminated due to being an offender. Similarly, if you had high racial self-stigma, uh, you also had higher criminal self-stigma. So again, that kind of combines the stereotypes of being from a certain racial minority group and then also being involved in the criminal justice system. So basically, two stigmas are combining to exacerbate negative outcomes. And again, I show that picture of intersectionality that people have these multiple dimensions to them, both self-labeled and ascribed by society. And these intersections really can impact uh, how we function in the world and in this case, respond uh, to mental health treatment and our mental health outcomes. Now, oh, I'm sorry if I didn't have the right slide up there. Um, for hypothesis three, we uh, found further interaction effects. So again, just in statistical terms, this means that combining these various identities uh, can lead to more negative outcomes, that having high stig self-stigma in multiple areas. So we found that people who had higher racial self-stigma scores, uh, they were more likely to experience negative effects in terms of criminal self-stigma on self-esteem scores and criminal self-stigma on medication adherence as well as mental illness self-stigma on med medication adherence. Um, so again, these factors can kind of combine to create all of these negative outcomes. Also, the higher the criminality self-stigma score, so the higher you believe, for example, you were bad, that you were an offender, or um, yeah, a bad person for having committed a crime, perhaps. Uh, you were also more likely to have negative effects from mental illness self-stigma. So I know this is a lot to kind of put together, but again, the gist of it is that these multiple identities are combining uh, to create negative outcomes. And if you're afflicted by one self-stigma, you're likely to be afflicted by another self-stigma as well, which can create these negative outcomes. So again, consistent with this intersectionality perspective, um, these interaction effects uh, indicated that criminality self-stigma, again, magnified the effects of both lower racial concept and higher mental illness self-stigma on negative outcomes. And as we said, provide some evidence that self-stigma combinations can have a real negative out, uh, impact on self-esteem and medication adherence greater than that of just one stigmatized identity or looking at it separately. However, some hypotheses um, were not supported. Uh, so for example, criminality self-stigma um, was not related to self-esteem or higher depression. This could be that our sample was small uh, and more studies should look at that, um, but we did not find that that was directly related. So switching gears a little bit to our qualitative aspect of this study. So what I just reported on was the quantitative data. Those are the numbers, the statistical interactions, and looking at how people respond to the scales. We also chose eight participants from this sample um, to do more of an open-ended interview. We picked eight people who we thought were representative um, of kind of the study and, and had a, a story to share. And uh, they all accepted invitation. It was a pretty diverse group. Four identified as African American or Black. Two identified as Latino, Latina, or Hispanic. One as European American or White. And one as other. Six were men. The age range was pretty wide, but the mean was uh, middle aged. Most had a high school education. And what did we ask in this interview? Well, we, we asked a whole bunch of questions. The interview could have 
could last from 45 minutes to over an hour. We asked about how arrest records impacts uh, participants' thoughts and beliefs about themselves. We also asked what type of discrimination or stigma bothers them the most. Is it the mental illness stigma? Is it the racial stigma? Is it being an offender? Is it something else? And we also use this uh, kind of nifty measure called the 20 statements test. And essentially on this measure, uh, you're given 20 I am statements with a blank after it. And you're asked to kind of just freely input what comes to mind. And, and that is believed to measure people's identity and self-concept, kind of what they believe about themselves. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and categories can range from physical, you might put your height and age, um, you may put social groupings, attributes about yourself, or just more global or kind of vague responses, I'm human, I'm me. So this is just a picture of our recent publication, uh, the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology published this. Uh, we put a lot of work into it, so we're uh, very happy to publish it and very happy to share it with you all today. And it was entitled Forensic Psychiatric Experiences, Stigma, and Self-Concept, Mixed Methods, because we use the qualitative interview. Okay, so what were some of our hypotheses going into this? Well, for the 20 statements test, we hypothesized that if you had more responses, so again, not everyone answered all 20, but we hypothesized the more total responses you had, um, you would have less self-stigma. And, and we thought that might be the case because maybe you have a more multifaceted and well-defined self-concept if you're able to use many different phrases or words to describe yourself. We also believe that having more social responses would be related to less self-stigma. And again, a similar hypothesis that maybe this would represent more social connection if you say uh, you're a mother or a father, for example, uh, maybe you're proud of these roles and that can kind of buffer uh, self-stigma. Uh, third, we believe that more global responses would be related to more self-stigma. So for example, again, these are people who say like, I am human, I am me, I am alive. Um, relatively less well-defined words, and we thought that may uh, be kind of a risk factor for self-stigma. Lastly, we thought that more attributive responses um, would be, again, related to less self-stigma. And again, with the idea of perhaps this is related to more insight, if you're able to attribute things to yourself, like I'm friendly, I'm loving, I am nice, uh, that could be related to less self-stigma. And what I'm showing now is an example of what the 20 statements test looks like. Um, and we would give something like this in person to the participants. We interviewed them on site, either at the hospital or at the court diversion program. And we would give them about five minutes or so to complete the task. Uh, very few people did all 20, which you'll see in a second. Uh, but we encourage them to write as many as they could. Okay, so what I'm showing now is a, a chart of some common 20 statements test responses, uh, as well as some of the means. Uh, so on average, people put 12 responses out of 20. And then you could see some examples of physical responses, like good looking, fat, cute. Um, and some of the other categories uh, that are up there. Um, just to note the physical example here, uh, you will note that people can put both positive and negative items. So for example, you may think that good looking or uh, small or, or tall may be relatively positive, but for some people writing fat or chubby or other uh, uh, items that they may think are negative, um, that may have a kind of detrimental impact. But again, sometimes people own these labels, so it may not be negative. But we couldn't necessarily say what was positive and negative in the study, so we didn't go there. So what were the results? Um, so 
consistent, um, or rather, I'm sorry, I should say inconsistent with our hypotheses, we actually found that having more responses on the 20 statements test was related to more racial self-stigma. So the more um, higher number of responses you had on the 20 statements test, you were more likely to believe, for example, oh, I'm bad for being an offender. Um, so one theory for this is that maybe role accumulation, having many labels about yourself, is not always beneficial. Because like I said, some of those labels can be negative. So if you have someone who perseverates on negative characteristics about themselves, um, they may have a lot of responses, but it doesn't mean it's positive. In terms of global responses, that was consistent with our hypotheses. So we did find that people who had those vague responses, like I'm alive, I'm human, they were more likely to have criminal self-stigma. So it could be a combination of the first two uh, findings I'm showing you there, that people are maybe writing a lot of global responses, um, which is related to more self-stigma. And maybe more susceptible to integrating stigma into their identity. In terms of attributive responses, this did confirm my, our hypotheses as well. So people who had attributive responses, such as good, loving, friendly, these people had less mental illness self-stigma, which is kind of unsurprising that if you're attributing uh, relatively positive characteristics to yourself, uh, you would have less self-stigma. Uh, it may also indicate just a better self-reflectiveness, more insight in some ways, um, and a better ability to integrate aspects of yourself rather than just membership in a social category, rather than just being a person living with mental health. Um, we did not find any uh, relationships on the social 20 statements test item. So I'm a mother, I'm a father, that did not relate to anything. So that was inconsistent with our hypotheses too. But again, we need a bigger sample to test this more in the future. So for the interview, we didn't have any a priori hypotheses. This was very exploratory. We wanted to hear about self-stigma from our participants' point of view. And after we completed the interviews, we transcribed what the people said because we did voice record with permission. And uh, 10 domains emerged based on our thematic analysis. We had three to four people kind of agreeing on what themes to use. Uh, three emerged for mental illness, race, and criminality. So that's nine. Three for each. And the subcategories were uh, experience. So, for example, when you were first diagnosed with mental illness, what was that like? Community perception and reaction. So what you perceive the community to think about you in terms of your race, ethnicity. And then individual reaction. So, for example, what is it like for you living with a... Uh, a criminal conviction or, or having this uh, history of being an offender. What is it like for you? So again, we're really getting at stigma and uh, specifically self-stigma um, in a nuanced way, getting at it from the perspectives of these individuals rather than giving them just a scale to you. And then our last theme was uh, for intersectionality. And again, our stick figure friend comes back and we still want to keep in mind that we are um, kind of a combination of many different factors, and not just the sum of our parts, but how these parts interact and multiply uh, together. So I thought the best way to present the results of uh, these interviews um, was to give some representative examples. So one person told us that, in my opinion, I just think that people see you as damaged goods. That's what somebody had once told me when I was sharing with them my struggles with mental illness. Oh, you're just damaged goods. So that would be an example of someone's experience in the community um, with perceptions of mental illness. The second one, uh, I can go into, let's say, uh, a university and get discriminated. I can feel the discrimination. I just can feel it. Maybe it's because of the way I'm dressed, or the way I'm wearing my hair, or the mustache on my face, or if I'm not shaven. Um, 
oh, I didn't have the rest of it there. But um, that one essentially is getting at the idea um, that how one looks can also uh, be st uh, stigmatized as well. Um, where they may say I'm an animal is the finish of that film. And then the third one is uh, once they see the background check and they see all your charges, they don't want to hire because of that. It's not like I'm still out there trying to commit crimes. I'm just trying to do the right thing, just get a nine to five. So you can see from these three examples that people identify um, negative interactions with the community about having a mental illness or being discriminated for race, ethnicity, or physical. In terms of intersectionality and combining these, uh, we had some people quite eloquently say um, how these stigmatized identities multiply in their own life. So for example, someone said, uh, I think if I wasn't black and if I was white, I don't think there would have been such a rush to get me to plea to the felony. I really think they would have handled it differently. So this person is talking about what it means to be a black person in the criminal justice system. So that would be an intersection of your race and ethnicity identity and having an offender, kind of that part of who you are or a label that is ascribed to you rather. I'll let you all read the second one. So this brought something really interesting to our study. Uh, this is a person talking about people perhaps uh, of a lower socioeconomic status, uh, not having enough money maybe to see a psychiatrist. Um, so that involved part of intersectionality in terms of social class and how much money and privilege you might have and how that could affect uh, getting effective care. Most participants overall appear to endorse uh, stigma related to mental illness uh, and being labeled an offender. Uh, half of the participants indicated that criminal justice involvement exacerbates psychiatric symptoms. So, for example, many people said that being locked up or being in a jail or prison made their symptoms worse or maybe created some symptoms or led them to develop some traumatic symptoms, per se. Um, again, people also talked about multiplying those identities in terms of legal authorities uh, may care less about people with mental illness or they may not get effective legal representation. All consistent with our earlier data, most people did say that racial stigma was most bothersome. They said they were affected by mental illness stigma and um, stigma related to being in the criminal justice system, but they said they were really affected by stigma toward their race and ethnicity. So just concluding everything here, I bring us back to our take home message that multiple stigmatized identities, uh, I should actually say do impact one's self concept uh, and can influence psychiatric treatment outcomes. Uh, a triple stigma does appear to exist uh, whereby individuals experience stigma from these three categories that we've been talking about today and probably many more. Of course, there are limitations with our research, just like any study. Uh, for one, we had a small sample, just 82 people. We conducted the study in a urban uh, part in the northeast of the United States. Um, and it'd really be important for future studies to maybe use more measures, do more in-depth interviews, use bigger samples, more diverse samples. And also look at uh, other stigmatized identities. So this might be sexuality, gender identification, class, ability status, language. Um, it goes on and on, and it'd be really interesting to see how those areas may interact. Uh, implications are important. I mean, for mental health professionals especially, when working with individuals who have combined um, stigmatized identities, rehabilitation really needs to consider how those identities may overlap and combine to lead to negative outcomes. Um, if you were here for Dr. Giannis's talk earlier, you may have heard him talk about kind of narrative enhancement, cognitive therapy. Um, that is one way to target mental illness self-stigma. It would really be interesting to adapt that intervention and maybe see if we could target self-stigma related to being an offender or being of a certain racial and ethnic group. And based on our 20 statements test findings, maybe other targets may include focusing on personal attributes in a balanced and nuanced way, 
and moving away a bit from more global identifications of, of how you uh, identify. And last but not least, uh, it's very important, of course, to focus on self-stigma and how people of stigmatized groups um, think about themselves and internalize these attitudes and how it can lead to negative outcomes. But really, at the end of the day, stigma is not a personal problem. It's a societal problem. And uh, public stigma programs uh, need to continue uh, to be introduced to break down that stigma in society, because that is the root of self-stigma. Self-stigma exists because public stigma is occurring. And I want to thank you all and uh, open the floor for any questions or discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I think it's really important to look at these intersections and that it's useful for us to be made aware of that. We really appreciate your sharing your research with us. And I'm thinking we're going to have some very interesting questions here. Uh, we have a long question from MOOC. So let me read it out loud and you may be able to read it as well. Uh, MOOC says, you said, Self-stigma affects a relatively high percentage of people with severe mental illness. And she wants to know, would that have anything to do with the Stanley Milgram effect, where subjects in experiments often voluntarily yield in decision making to staff with white coats and obvious authority, which had the power to remove the mantle of responsibility from the subject, such as I'll take responsibility for that, and the, the uh, research subjects then agree to do something they might not usually do. Might self-stigma be higher in people with severe mental illness because these people are the ones most likely to be in close contact with psychiatric professionals and carers who have the power to moderate or influence the subject's sense of responsibility, beliefs, and labels? Well, wow, that's a good question. Is that that's a, yeah. That, that's a very good question. And, and you know, Stanley Milgram uh, showed us a lot about the effects of uh, a power figure and obedience uh, on people. And I, I never really thought about it in that way. That's really interesting. And, and I have, I guess, two thoughts related to it. So one thought is that um, we need to break down stigma among mental health professionals and other doctors, too, because uh, at the end of the day, stigma is a power dynamic. And stigma comes from powerful places and is usually put down on stigmatized people who don't have a lot of power. So if there are negative messages coming from doctors, psychiatrists, etc., that can certainly contribute to self-stigma. So we need to train our doctors and mental health professionals to uh, give as many hopeful messages as possible to improve uh, that. Similarly, I, I mean, I think the Milgram study can also be relevant to public stigma and what the community believes about mental illness. And I think similarly, we probably need more people in power, such as the president, um, high-powered doctors, people who are very visible, poli other politicians, to also give out positive messages. Because the Milgram study showed that people can be very obedient to a power figure, and we really need uh, positive messages coming from the top down. Um, so I know uh, that was a little tangential, but I hope that answers your question. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. What did you mean when you were talking about public stigma reduction programs? Are there some good ones out there that we ought to be using that we need to find out about? That's another great question. So uh, the, the gold standard for public stigma reduction um, is generally contact. So having contact with someone with a mental illness. So some programs in the United States and worldwide uh, involve having a person with mental illness share their story of recovery, share what has helped them, share how they're functioning. Um, and that tends to have the most powerful effect, along with some education too. But contact is one of the most important things. 
Okay, we have another question here. Jennifer asked, why do we see others as damaged goods in the first place? It's our flaws which help make us who we are and help us build personality and character. Why can't we see others as being perfect as who they are? That's also a great question, Jennifer. I, I wish more people thought like you, uh, but unfortunately there are people out there who, um, for lack of a better word, are ignorant. They, they believe that certain features are flaws and they believe that they represent weakness or they represent an inability to do something. Um, but I totally agree with you though, that we can certainly look at any physical feature or label and see the positives that come from it and how it just makes us who we are. And that's the goal of, of public stigma programs. We need more people to start thinking like that. And Jennifer followed up by saying, oh, I scrolled out of my review here. Jennifer said, we all have stories to tell. By not accepting others for who they are, we are not allowing ourselves to see others in their eyes. And then she said, ignorant to close their own minds. I, I think uh, if I'm if I'm understanding your question, Jennifer, I think people are um, ignorant about mental health because they haven't had a lot of contact with it. So they may not know someone with a mental illness. They may not have ever had a mental health concern themselves. They may not know the uh, the research on mental illness and recovery. So I think. Uh, giving more of that to people to contact and the education can reduce the ignorance. Jennifer also asked, maybe they're ignorant to their own knowledge of what they fear and what scares them. I think that's absolutely right in some situations. I think people can be so overwhelmed by fear and the other, quote unquote, um, that it's hard for them to even get to that place. And Mook reminds Jennifer of a quote from Hercule Poirot, you attribute always to others the sentiments that you yourself experience. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good one. And, and, you know, some theories for why we stigmatize may be projection of our own insecurities or, or fears, um, which again, I think largely stem from ignorance and kind of lack of contact with, with other people. So another question, we know in the disability community that some types of disabilities are less stigmatized than others. Hidden disabilities, for example, like mental illnesses are often more stigmatized than visible disabilities like an amputation. Are there differences between stigmatization of different types of mental illnesses? Yes, there absolutely are. So. Uh... People with schizophrenia tend to be stigmatized the most. Um, so these are people with schizophrenia who may have delusions. They may be living with hallucinations. Um, they tend to be stigmatized the most as violent, as unpredictable, which uh, is largely, largely untrue in a stereotype. Um, people, for example, with depression, anxiety, other mental health conditions that can often be more concealable um, are less stigmatized. And uh, just to add, I see Jennifer posted a follow up there. I, I mean, I think sometimes people may fear personal hurt. They may feel like they could be attacked by someone with a mental illness. Um, but I think like that quote was alluding to before, I think sometimes people also feel the reality of how prevalent mental health problems are and, and they're worried that that could be them one day or, or they might be susceptible. So I think that uh, process plays out too. And Pecos asks a question, and I think I'm going to ask him to clarify this. He said, were any members of your study people with disability? I think you mean other than the, the mental illness disability, right? And Missy says she has it. She says schizoaffective disorder is more acceptable than uh, schizophrenia. schizophrenia. Got it. So, so to Pecos' question, um... We did not measure that, so I, I don't know 
for sure and we don't have that in our in our uh, data but uh such an important intersection to study in future research to see if if that is potentially internalized negatively by some people um and, and to missy's question yeah there are a lot of variations in the human condition and um I, I think, again, this comes back to ignorance that I, I doubt much of the public even knows the difference between schizophrenia or schizoaffective. So uh, a lot of education is required, too, to let people know what, what these mental health conditions are really about. And Britt is adding, adding, the fear is the unknown. You can't see mental illnesses. They're on the inside. You never know what is truly going on in the minds of others. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly part of it, right? That uh, it's kind of intangible, and I think that's where people's fears can come from, too. James says, I confess that a former friend of mine had that schizophrenia. It was not a problem for me until she came unglued with me one time and scared the heck out of me. I avoided her after that. It was like she became a completely different person and she was simply not safe. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, James. I mean, people uh, with mental illness can have relapses and can uh, display certain symptoms that, that can seem alarming. Um, but certainly the vast majority are, are not violent or not dangerous. Um, but people have varying degrees of symptoms and... Uh, mm -hmm. That certainly comes up in the research too. That friends and family uh, can might feel unsafe or, or not sure how to respond to crises. Um, but yeah, it can be disconcerting uh, when you have an experience like that, James. Certainly. And Jennifer is responding to Britt, saying, "But to close ourselves off to the experiences of others, to the knowledge that they possess." And Lori Jo. Go ahead, answer. No, I'm sorry, I, I missed that, Jenna. Can you? Sure. This was Jennifer responding to Britt, and Jennifer said, but to close ourselves off to the experiences of others, to the knowledge that they possess. Right, and, and I think some people uh, do that. I, I would certainly advocate for for the opposite that i think the more open we are as a society about mental illness the less stigmatized it will become uh, but there are a lot of people out there who don't like talking about their mental health or diagnoses and often for good reason they feel like they'll be stigmatized but i feel like once society gets to a place where we can talk more openly about it we, we can start to see some less stigma and Gloria Joy says, it is amazing how just one level up on a med can change a person totally. Yeah, pe people have all sorts of, of individualized recoveries. For some people, it, it, therapy, yeah, that's all they need. For others, it's uh, medication that has the powerful effect. So um, this is another way to think about mental illness, that it's very unique and individualized, and it's not one size fits all in terms of symptoms and recovery. And Jennifer is saying, we need to not fear, and Matilda is responding, but fear is human. Perhaps we need to accept that in our fellow humans. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of both. I think we need to accept that we are fearful creatures and, and that that emotion comes up. But I think it's also important to think about and process where is that fear coming from? Because the emotion tends to happen after you have a thought. So... I, I would encourage people to have a, a visceral emotion to think, what is the thought that, that led to that? And related to that, what about journalism's role in stigmatization? Journal, journalism used to have the um, motto, if it bleeds, it bleeds. You know, they're going to take the yeah. worst part yeah, that is, um, I mean, some forms of journalism and particular papers have been quite damaging to mental health. Um, there have been many sensational stories about mental health and violence and crimes. Um, and there are actually...
guidelines in the United States that are out in terms of how to report on mental health. But, you know, we, we frequently see stories about people with mental illness being violent in the news, but there aren't as many stories about people with mental illness recovering and functioning and living well. And, and, you know, those people represent the majority. So, And Missy is sharing something very personal. She says she feels a lot of stigma here in Second Life when she meets people. She doesn't tell them her disability because schizophrenia has so much stigma. She can't find the right timing to reveal herself. She doesn't know if she's ready to let people know, so she hides here. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And and like I said, uh, diagnoses or symptoms can, can carry stigma with them, and, and people may want to be or think they need to be cautious about that. Um, but disclosing mental health symptoms and diagnoses is a very personal decision, and it's important to weigh the pros and cons and your reason for doing it and how you feel about it. Uh, but again, it's it's very individualized and it's it's something that you want to link to your goals and what you want to achieve with, with that. But I appreciate you sharing it today. And I think we have time for just one last comment. Mook says, fear is also an evolutionary response to unpredictability, as in James's scenario. When you cannot predict what someone or something is going to do, you have no directions for action or decision. So it's safer just to stay away and avoid it or them. Right, and, and that's absolutely correct. So humans need fear. If a snake is nearby, right, you need to know to get away from that snake. Uh, if a house is on fire, right, fear is very adaptive. You need to know to get out. Uh, in the case of mental illness, I, I think, again, people need to think about what the root of the fear is. If uh, people learn more about mental illness and realize that the base rate of violence is quite low and that many people recover, or many people living with mental illness are friends and family members and bosses, that can slowly diminish that fear response, I, I, I do believe. our audience to thank our presenter. Um, Ice Guy asked a question. She's sneaking it in at the last minute there. It would help if society, certain segments of it, would stop whipping up that fear and stigma against people with mental illness or blame people with mental illness for things that happen or go wrong. We have to reduce that attitude. So what are the best ways to do that? Very good points again, Ice Guy. I, I think I would go back to, uh, one, the gold standard of contact. So more programs need to be rolled out like that so you can see a people a, a person living with mental illness. I, I think to the question before, journalism needs to improve how they report about mental illness. Um, but society in general, like no matter where you live, laws and policies that discriminate toward people with mental illness also need to be dismantled. So I think it takes kind of a, a, a multi-dimensional approach to, to get there. for really great information today. And also thanks to the audience. You shared a lot of information and a lot of very personal stories and that's, that's what makes this a very rich environment. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you all, it was a, it was a pleasure and I, I really appreciate the, the questions and the conversation.